God's own heart. So you're in good company. Thank you, Carla, for putting up with me. Uh, just a moment, I'm going to read from the First Timothy chapter six, beginning at verse six. But before we do that, I want to share a little something. I, there was a man who waited for a very long time at his. Uh, Basically, he was waiting to get called uh, up to the Department of Motor Vehicles. We don't have this problem in Oklahoma too often, but in, let me tell you, in California, it's an all-morning or all-day ordeal some days. So anyway, uh, after he, the man finally made it to the window, the clerk said, how can I help you? And he said, well, I need to get a haircut. Could you save my spot? And the teller said, very indignant, well, why didn't you get a haircut before you came here? He said, well, I didn't need one before I got here. <laughs> Hindsight, I probably should have saved this one for a day when I deal with patients, but uh, I just couldn't wait, so there you go. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning in verse 6. But godliness with contentment is of great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you... Uh, made your confession in the presence of many witnesses. And in the sight of God, who gives life to everything, and of Christ Jesus, who, while testifying before Pontius Pilate, made the good confession, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see. To him be honor and might forever. Amen. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way they will lay up for lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks. Amen. 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 But when I first gave my life to Christ, I didn't have a clue how little I knew about God. Or how much, how little actually I knew about God's desire for my life. I, I still have a lot to learn in that regard, but back then, my knowledge was extremely limited. I remember reading a passage from Psalm 37, 4 that says this, Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. My heart and mind at that time was a long way from being renewed. And I thought, I've got a lot of desires God's going to give me. Boy, this is good stuff, this Christianity stuff. This stuff. What I failed to understand back then was that it said, Delight yourself in the Lord. First, and this meant that I must learn to be delighted in the very presence of God. And, and after doing so for a length of time, I would become more and more like God. And if you learn to delight in God, your heart is naturally transformed and you no longer have worldly desires. You once did. Instead, your heart starts to look more and more like God's heart, filled with his desires. And these are the desires that God says he will willingly give those who delight in I know this to be true on many personal levels, but also because the passage goes on to say, commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will do this. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn, the justice of your cause like the noonday sun. I've learned that when I seek the Lord, I place myself into God's care, and he raises me up to be an example of his blessing and his mercy. Understanding how to put yourself in God's care is extremely important. Because unless you grasp the concept in verse 6, you're never going to understand. And if you recall, verse 6 says this. It says, godliness with contentment is of great gain. Let's say that again. Godliness with contentment is great gain. When you seek godliness for your own heart, your mind, and your life, you become more and more content 
with what you have. When you have true godliness, you know that you have all that is truly important in the scope of eternity and thus being at peace and content. You may not have riches saved up. You may not have a house to live in even or, or even know what you're going to wear tomorrow. But if you have real godliness, you can be content in Christ alone. Paul and the apostles were content in a prison cell. Praise him, God. Would they like to have been somewhere else? Sure, they'd have loved to have been at the Ritz Hill. But they were still content. Why aren't we content or satisfied with only food and clothing? I'd like to start by suggesting the obvious. We live, arguably, in the most spoiled country the world has ever known. And in the most spoiled country the world has ever known, there is true, there is a growing poverty in this country today, but most people here have way more than they will ever need, and that excess and abundance has caused an overactive desire for more, which is what the Scripture says. Instead of comparing ourselves with Christ, we are constantly comparing ourselves with the rich and famous. Lifestyles of the rich and famous. It was a show. How many remember? Lifestyles of the rich and famous. It even had a snobby accent. And people watched it because they wanted to see what opulence looked like. And what did it end up doing? Making them want more. We compare ourselves with the wealthy models on Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or whatever social media thing you like to look at. The result of bad comparisons is a constant desire for more. Let me say that again. The result when you make bad comparisons is a constant desire for more. I know people that are put out if, they, if they're not being pampered on a regular basis. They feel put out if they're not traveling every couple of months or more. Some feel put out if they don't have their mani-pedis or their massages or their spa treatments or whatever. Some are put out if they're not taking a safari hunt a couple times a year. And some get upset if they're not on a cruise several times a year. And many are the people who feel they need to buy something to feel content. But all these things have one thing in common. They are only a short-term fix for the discontent. It's a short-term fix. It's kind of like an addict. A drug addict needs what? A fix. Doesn't last long, and then they need another fix, and another fix. But godly contentment doesn't require fixes. It requires the presence of God. And then there are some who get cranky if they don't get their retail therapy every so often, and some like to play golf weekly, or some it has to be boating, and some aren't content unless they're playing or pampering themselves in some form or fashion. They feel as though they deserve to be pampered or catered to or spoiled in some way. But Scripture says you ought to be content in simply being godly. And being content with that is all you really need. I can tell you that the passage plays in my head whenever I think I deserve something or need pampered in some way. I, I pray that it will begin to play back in your head when you start to feel discontent. And instead of just fulfilling your flesh, you are literally asking God at times to be okay with the purchase. And I want you to do that. Next time you think about fulfilling the flesh and doing whatever it is that you think you need pampered on, stop and say, God, is, is that okay? Asking somebody if you can spend their money on frivolous things is a good way in a business model. And it also reminds us that all we have is His. It's not ours. See, if it was ours, we can do whatever we want with it. But if it's His, then we need to say, God, is, is this is it all right with you? That's how you know if it's yours or His. If you're just entrusted with it, as we say we are, we'll ask Him if it's all right with Him. But if it's ours and we possess it, we don't have to ask anybody anything. We just do I used to work for a man that referred to his wife as, and I wouldn't advise this gentleman, the head of the discontent department. He was teasing when he said it, but there was a truth to it, the likes of which you can't imagine. This particular lady was constantly changing the furniture at the house, the things in the house. She'd go buy something, and two months later, she'd move that out, move new stuff in. Honest to goodness, she was constantly changing everything she was never content with anything. In fact, he used to tease, I'm surprised she lets me stay around. And he said, if it wasn't for the money, I think she'd kick me out too. But she's, she likes to spend it too much. That was his, his jargon. 
She did it with clothes, she did it with shoes, hairdos, glasses, and the list goes on and on. One of the managers that I used to work for, she, actually she was a business owner, and I was managing a, a dental lab at the time. Uh, she had something uh, going on, and she was very discontent. If you ever went out to eat with this particular woman, she would, oftentimes, she would wait until the water was served, maybe chips were brought out, and all that was done. Before they took the orders, you're already eating, and you know, you're, you're nibbling, and you're drinking, and she'd say, I don't like anything on this menu. Let's leave. You might have 12, 14 people in the business meeting, and she just says, I I'm just, I'm going. I finally got tired of it one day. I said, I'll see you later. We're we have a business meeting, and we don't have time. These people have to get back from lunch. Well, I got a business to run. I don't have time to go somewhere else. I said, if you need to go, go ahead. She was, let me tell you, she was hot. <laughs> she was hot. But discontent. Never content with what's before them. You can't be around discontent for long periods and not become discontent yourself. You will over time become like them, believing that you are something special that you should be catered to as well. You hang out with discontent people, you become discontent, and it starts to bleed onto you. Well, I need this, I need that. They, they say they need it, they I need that. Yeah, I, I need that. It's kind of the keeping up with the Joneses syndrome. But it has to do with contentment. In the next verse, Paul says, but if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Do you have food and clothing? Most of us have more than we can probably eat in several months. Honestly, what else do you need? We live in a culture that tells us we need a car for every licensed driver in the house. People think they need designer clothes, handbags, and all the accessories that go with them. Watch the housewives from let's just say a warm place on TV, and you can see just how spoiled and arrogant some people can be. And while you're watching TV, the commercials are there trying to convince you that you deserve every item they're trying to sell you. You deserve this. You deserve a break today. So get up and get away to something that's probably going to kill you. You can finish the song. I won't go there. I don't want the mail. They make you believe also in commercials that you should have the latest and greatest technology, the latest model car. Godly contentment has never been based about the number of our possessions, but about the relationship that we have with God. People that have very little are some of the most content people I've ever known. People with much are usually the most discontent people I've ever known. So the number of possessions are not the way to tell who's content. By the same token, being able to spoil yourself is not the measure of contentment either. For the wealthy use more chair time in therapeutic offices than the poor by far. That's because things and money don't bring about happiness. Discontent is derived from a lack of intimacy with God. For when we lack intimacy with God, our spirit is starving and our flesh screams to be fed. Our flesh has many desires and when we fail to feed our spirit by being in his presence, the flesh is going to be fed and overrun the other. So we're feeding only the flesh. There's an old story credited to a Cherokee Indian chief. The story goes that he was teaching about his grandson, uh, about life. He said, a fight's going on inside of me. And he said, there's a fight between wolves. The dark one is evil. He's anger, envy, sorrow, regret, greed, arrogance, self-pity, guilt, resentment, inferiority, lies, false pride, superiority, and ego. And he continued to and there's a light wolf in me that's good. He's joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, humility, kindness, benevolence, and empathy, generosity, truth, compassion, and faith. He said, the same fight's going on inside you, grandson, and inside of every other person on the face of the earth. And the grandson pondered for a moment, and he asked, Grandfather, which wolf wins? And the old Cherokee chief is said to have responded, well, the one you feed. Are you feeding the flesh, or are you feeding the spirit? The story has great merit. We're going to have joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, humility, kindness, benevolence, empathy, generosity, truth, compassion, and faith as a result of feeding our spirit. Our text tells us that the one way we can feed the evil in us is, and he says this, people who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. 
Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. The scripture doesn't say that money is evil. It says the love of money or being eager for money is evil. I know of wealthy, wealthy believers that are not lovers of money, and God has blessed them incredibly. They do wonderful things with their extra monies that they acquire because they strive to put God first in all things. Just a couple examples, uh, Hobby Lobby and Mardell's. You've heard of them. They're very devout Christians. You can't go to that store on Sunday because it's closed. They're living out their faith, and uh, they are shut down. They believe that's the Sabbath, and they believe they're honoring God in that regard. Kudos to them. Another business would be Chick-fil-A, also closed on Sundays. And if either of these loved money, I assure you they'd be open on Sunday because, you know, the flesh wants fed. And there's, there's money coming in Sundays, money to be had. Those church people are out looking for a place to eat on Sunday and places to shop. So if they wanted to, and they were concerned about it, to increase their profit margins, they would be open on Sundays as well. Now, what can we do to avoid the pitfalls of the love of money? Well, we can focus on that which Scripture tells us to. It says in verse 11, But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue, chase after, long for, attain, strive towards, righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. We are to pursue these things. I think that'd make a great sermon series. I may have to pull that up here later. But if you're fleeing from something, you're not standing still. You're running towards these things. And by doing so, you're running from the love of money. Do you see the difference? You have to put the love of money behind you to, to chase after these things. You've literally turned your back on the love of money to pursue this stuff. Striving towards you have a, have a different goal besides the love of money. Now, church, if you're not pursuing the things of God, you're likely growing in your love for money and pursuing the things that satisfy selfish desires of your flesh. And over time, there will grow discontent in your heart. Maybe you're here today or watching online and you, you, you once sought the things of God. And maybe you've been uh, wondering why you don't feel like you're happy or whole anymore. Maybe you stopped seeking the righteousness. God for your heart and your mind, and you've been drifting along, going with the flow, but the flow has you out on a very tumultuous ocean, being tossed about, and, and you're just sickened. You've lost your happy, and on your best days, you feel like you're barely able to tolerate the meager existence in your life, and maybe you have little or nothing positive to show for your work at the end of the day, and there was once a time when you felt fulfilled and happy and content. I've been doing this pastoral thing for a while. I've had a lot of people in my office over the years or met them in the highways and byways, and they ask the question, why am I not happy? And so my typical response, usually, depending upon what I know about their history, is where were you last when you were, and what were you doing when you lost your happy? Where were you at? What were you doing when your happiness left you? I can't tell you how many times people's eyes widen and they sit back and say something like, well, I guess you're telling me my problem started when I left church. My response is, I'm not telling you anything. I'm asking a question that you know the answer to, but if that's the answer to the question, then you know what you need to do to be happy again, to be content, to be at peace. Brothers and sisters, I quote Jesus constantly, and there's a very good reason I do. It's because your eternal happiness depends on you doing what Jesus tells you to do. And Jesus said this, seek first the kingdom of heaven and all his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. But seek first the kingdom of heaven and its righteousness. If you seek money, you're going to find emptiness and trouble. But if you seek God of all creation, strive to draw near to Him every day, you'll find godliness with contentment, and He will give you your needs. You see, only Jesus can truly fill the God-sized hole inside of a human being. Would you rather seek the emptiness of riches and be sad, or would you rather be cared for and walking peaceful in the Spirit of God as He fills your heart and makes you a content individual? I'm asking you to continue to fight the good fight of faith. I'm, I'm not asking because it's best for the church. I'm asking because it's best for you. 
I want to shift gears now for a moment and speak to those, there might be some out there who are struggling with real needs. There was a Christian comedian that used to tell a joke about a pastor's sermon series on content for Christians, and the punchline was the title of the series. It was uh, Content or Discontent, Which Tent Do You Live In? I'm not much for that trite stuff, but works for some people. Contentment in the Christian life is really not a laughing matter. The problem is that when contentment is missing, the void is occupied by the sin of discontent, a blatant dissatisfaction with God. Did you hear that? Discontent in the life of a believer is a blatant dissatisfaction in God. God hasn't met my needs, therefore I'm discontent. God hasn't provided, therefore I'm not content. God hasn't done enough for me, therefore I'm discontent. I'm not getting my needs met in God, therefore I have to meet them through other means. Psalm 73 is a man's confession of his journey from discontentment with God through a time of understanding and to repentance, after which he became satisfied in God despite his horrible circumstances. Now the first 14 verses are a psalmist's description of why he was discontent. Essentially he was envious of the wicked because they were prosperous more prosperous than him. He wanted to have the money they had. They were, then the psalmist grumbles against God for favoring the wicked while making his own personal life difficult. Remember, those who strive for more money become discontent. Remember that from our original text? Then the man comes to a place in the psalms when he realizes that the prosperity enjoyed by the wicked in this life is futile because they still have to face the final judgment of God. You've heard me say God doesn't always settle accounts in this lifetime, but he will settle accounts. The man recognizes that in Psalms. And then in verse 21 through 28, the psalmist explains the knowledge that turned his heart around. We learn five important lessons about content and discontent in Psalm 73. First, being content produces hard and heavy hearts and very unpleasant feelings. Being discontent produces hard or heavy hearts and, and uh, unpleasant feelings. Describing his former discontentment with God, the psalmist writes this. He says, when my heart was embittered and I was pierced within, these are admissions of his depression, his anxiety, and even anger brought on by his grumbling and discontent. And he's complaining about his position with God. It's your fault, God, because you allow this to happen. How dare you? Second, discontentment comes from a non-biblical thought process. In verse 22, the psalmist con connects his former bitterness of heart with his former lack of thinking. He said, then I was senseless and ignorant. In other words, I didn't understand. I, I, I wasn't thinking like you think, God. I was, I was limited in my knowledge. I was like a beast before you, he said. Nobody who's thinking biblically about his lot in life will be bitter towards God because God's promises in the Bible assure us that every trial that we face, no matter how severe or how long they last, are for our eternal good. It might be rough in this lifetime, but our eternity is what it's all about. Contentment is found in looking to the future. That's the number three. Verse 24 says, with your counsel, you will guide me and afterward receive me into glory. We're looking ahead. Note the word afterward. Glory for the believer comes later. We're, we're not to receive glory now. All glory, honor, and praise goes up to God right now. Our thing isn't the glory now, it's later. Paul assures us that even though we suffer now, glory is in our future. The same thought is found in 1 Peter. And, and that's another key to contentment. The willingness to do without for now or to suffer for now, or to have hard times now, if God wills it so, and to wait until later for perfect comfort and ease and bliss and prosperity. It is the ability to say, I, I choose to look at the future for where my life is going. I will be content in that no matter what i got to go through here to get there. Some of you ever had road trips to go visit family? Did you have kids that, let's just say they weren't road war warriors, the trip was a stinker. You might have had to pull one of those great, uh, great lines where, look kids, if I gotta pull this car over, somebody's gonna get hurt. Anybody ever say something like that? Or I'll give you, if I pull this car over, I'll give you something to cry about. 
Well, if you hadn't, you missed out on some road trips. But looking ahead, because the goal was worth the trip, going to see the family. You knew you were going to be there. You knew there would be some peace there and some comfort there, some enlightenment. And there was a reason you were making that trip. That's what life is all about for those who have so little. And then for contentment is the result of right comparisons. In Psalm 25, uh, the first 25 of that psalm, he, he tells, uh, he basically compares God with everything else. He says, whom am I in heaven but you, and who besides you? I desire nothing on earth. Certainly when he's hungry, he desires food. When he's cold, he needs warmth. And when he's destitute, he needs provision. But here's the deal. He says, everything on earth is second to my need for God. My need for food, my need for clothing, my need for relationship. Everything else is second to my need for God. Seek first the kingdom of heaven and all its righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. And then, contentment is found in the personal relationship with God. Not in what God gives us possessions to this life. Verse 26 of that psalm says, My flesh and my heart may fail. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. The writer is saying, even if everything that could possibly go wrong goes wrong, God is all that I really need for all eternity. Too many believers are happy in God only when they are experiencing good health, much wealth, peaceful relationships, and all their desires met. But these people are not showing contentment in God. They're only content with the many things that God gives them. You see the difference? One is content in God, the other is content in the blessings. And only when they've got enough blessings, and how many blessings are enough? Just a little bit more. Our psalm writer finally comes to the point where he is content with God himself. He begins to think, even if there would be future suffering, poverty, pain, I'd be content with God. And he writes in verse 28, the nearness of God is my good. He learned that he needed to be close to God, and the rest doesn't matter nearly as much. As being close to God. And one final note, the order of wording in Psalm 73, 26 is critical. The first half of the verse admits the likelihood of difficulty and trials, but the second half proclaims that knowing God is more important. In other words, the knowledge of God and knowing God intimately will empower you to overcome the difficulties, producing personal contentment in all situations. So I ask you this morning, are you content or discontent? Which tent do you live in? Remember that if you have a future glory in Christ, you shouldn't be comparing yourselves to unbelievers because they're going to have to face judgment of it one day, and you don't want any part of that. Also remember that you can be content when you remain in a right relationship with Christ and continually renew your mind with God's Word so that you are constantly reminded of why you stay in Christ. I believe that you can and will weather the storms of life ahead and remain in Christ and not get caught up chasing after the fame, the fortune, or worldly fun. Because fame, fortune, and worldly fun look pale in comparison when you keep your future inheritance of glory in mind. Do you want to be happy? Seek Him. Do you want to feel His loving arms around you? Seek Him. Do you want to be content in all things? Seek Him. Do you want to be at peace in your finances? Seek Him. Do you want to be a, have a friend that sticks closer than a brother? Then seek Him. Do you want to hear the secret things of God that He desires to share with you? Then seek Him. Do you desire to flee the love of money and stop feeding your flesh? Seek him. Do you know you are the apple of his eye? Seek him. Do you know that he sings over you? Seek him. Do you know that he will never leave you nor forsake you? Seek him. Do you know that God desires to walk and talk with you? Seek him. Maybe you don't know anything about what I'm speaking about. That's okay. You can still seek him while he may yet be found. Listen, none of us brought anything into this life. And we're not going to take anything out of it. Verse 8 says, but if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Are you content? Or are you consistently craving more? If you are, then seek him in his righteousness and you'll find a peace that passes all understanding. You'll find a commitment that you may have never known before. Some need to seek him so that you can find your purpose. But without vision, your purpose, and your reason for waking up every day, you're going to feel empty. We, we need purpose 
and our purpose is to love him and to serve him. So seek him and find what he wants you to do and then do it. And you'll find fulfillment in helping others and working in the family business and working in the family's kingdom business as a result of seeking God, walking with him, and submitting to his will for your life. So pursue righteousness, friends. And find contentment in a divine relationship with Christ. Your spirit craves the manna that only God can provide. The question is, will you seek him while he may be found? Amen. We're going to sing a uh, hymn of invitation. Page 399 of the hymn will also be on the screen. I would invite you to come to the altars this morning if you have any need, if you want to just come spend some time, just be with God, or maybe you have a